Pleasant evening and a warm welcome to the National News live on Channel I. I'm Dilanjali Ananda. A very good evening indeed. I'm Charita Miniparachi. And now let's move on to the headlines for tonight's news. Sri Lanka joins the countries which have inoculated more than half of the population. Sri Lanka ranks number one among the countries with the fastest vaccination drive. Foreign Minister responses to the statement of Human Rights Commissioner. Various entities emphasize that allegations made against Sri Lanka are baseless. A meeting between the Prime Minister and Sri Lankans living in Italy. The government sets a certified price of 55 rupees for a kilogram of Nadu Paddy. The national television obtains the official broadcasting rights of the T20 World Cup. On to those and other stories in detail now and starting off with local stories. Minister Professor G. L. Peris says that Sri Lankan government is committed to achieving tangible progress on the entire range of issues relating to accountability, reconciliation, human rights, peace and sustainable development as a responsible democratic government. The foreign ministry made these remarks while addressing the 48th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council. The foreign minister reiterated that the reject resolution 461 presented by the council. Madam President, let me begin by reiterating our strong and continued cooperation with this Council and the United Nations mandated human rights system in keeping with our constitution and our international obligations voluntarily undertaken. Twelve years ago, Sri Lanka eradicated LTT terrorism on its soil. We have restored peace, security and stability for the benefit of our people. We held firm to our democratic traditions and elections were held at regular intervals with high levels of voter participation, most recently at the 2019 presidential and 2020 parliamentary polls. The government is committed to holding the provincial council elections at the earliest. We are dealing with post-conflict recovery from the perspective of healing. Most recently, 16 LTT cadres convicted of serious terrorist crimes were granted presidential pardon. The success of post-conflict demining, reconstruction and resettlement programs has contributed immensely to national reconciliation. Despite the daily challenges of the devastating COVID-19 pandemic, let me highlight the progress made in the domestic processes. The Office on Missing Persons as its core function is finalizing the list of missing persons in collaboration with other agencies. The Office for Reparations has processed 3,775 claims this year. The Office for National Unity and Reconciliation continues its eight-point action plan. The National Human Rights Commission is carrying on its mandate. A steering committee on SDG 16 is working towards enhancing peace, justice and strong institutions. A cabinet subcommittee was appointed to revisit the PTA and to bring it in line with international norms and best practices. A report will be submitted to the cabinet of ministers at the end of this month. An advisory board was appointed to look into cases of detention under the PTA and to make recommendations to deal with such cases expeditiously. Speedy disposal of cases under the PTA is also taking place. A commission of inquiry headed by a sitting judge of the Supreme Court was established to address issues on accountability and missing person and to revisit recommendations by previous commission. The COI submitted its interim report to the president. The final report will be submitted within the next six months. We are maintaining vigorous engagement with civil society to obtain their insights and to harness their support in achieving reconciliation and development. Madam President, Sri Lanka continues to investigate and prosecute the perpetrators of the appalling terrorist attack on Easter Sunday in 2019, complying with due process of law in all respects. As always, we will remain vigilant in combating terrorism and protecting Sri Lankans of all religion. Madam President, we reject the proposal for any external initiatives purportedly established by Resolution 46 Stroke 1, while domestic processors are vigorously addressing the relevant matters. This will polarize our society as we experienced with Resolution 30 Stroke 1, 
The Council must adhere to its founding principles. External initiatives embarked upon without the cooperation of the country concerned cannot achieve their stated goals and will be subject to politicization. The resources expended on this initiative are unwarranted, especially when they are urgently needed for humanitarian and other constructive purposes in many parts of the world. Madam President, under the current and pressing challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, we consider it a basic duty of a government to ensure the uninterrupted supply of commodities essential to the life of the community. We are open in acknowledging our challenges and as a responsible and democratic government, we are committed to achieving tangible progress on the entire range of issues relating to accountability, reconciliation, human rights, peace and sustainable development. On Sri Lanka, the European Union stresses the need for continued efforts for reconciliation, accountability and human rights and encourages the government to remain engaged with the United Nations. We'd like to thank the High Commissioner for her update on Sri Lanka and call for the OHCHR to be granted the resources needed to implement Resolution 46-1. We recognise the challenges Sri Lanka is facing due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we'd like to express our condolences to the people of Sri Lanka for the many lives that have been lost. We continue to stress the importance of a comprehensive reconciliation and accountability process. We note Sri Lanka's declared intent to promote reconciliation and to ensure the continuity of the work of the Office of Missing Persons and the Office for Reparations. We call on the government to ensure the political independence of these institutions. We call on Sri Lanka to cooperate fully with the High Commissioner and remain ready to support the government on the implementation of Resolution 46-1. With respect to Sri Lanka, while there is room for improvement in the areas of national reconciliation and human rights, we understand that the government is taking various measures, including investigation by the Commission of Inquiry and payment of compensation. It is important that Sri Lanka continue to take voluntary actions and that the international community support Sri Lanka in this effort. On Sri Lanka, we acknowledge the ongoing efforts by the Sri Lankan government to enhance its human rights situation and to ensure accountability. We hope that Sri Lanka, in close cooperation with the UN human rights mechanisms, continues to work toward building national reconciliation and pursuing transitional justice. Former Chairman of Sri Lanka Human Rights Council, Pratima Mahanama, says that the United Nations Human Rights Commission is in the process of directing unacceptable allegations in relation to Sri Lanka. Various remarks were made at several media briefings heard today on the oral report submitted by Human Rights High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet yesterday. Minister Dallas Alahap Peruma said that two sections of the state of emergency were amended for the distribution of essential food commodities with the assistance of the security forces. He said that the general masses should realize the importance in the mediation of the security forces in the vaccination process. Therefore, he said that their assistance for the distribution of essential food commodities should also be considered in which they extend an active support. He added that the country continues to honor the membership of the United Nations as a founding member. He further said that government would not reject the observations made by the United Nations. However, he said that relevant decisions have to be made while considering the situation in the country as an index. Therefore, he added, it is evident that such occurrences are not taking place in the country at present. Former Chairman of Human Rights Council of Sri Lanka, Pratibha Mahanama, said that the oral reports consist of the issues which should be resolved within the nation to render justice and not relevant to the international sphere. 
He said that they should have observed and monitored the progress of the 46-1 resolution. The report has indicated that former parliamentarian has been given presidential pardon, he added. Former chairman said that the relevant decision was made in accordance with the powers vested with the president under the 34th section of 1978 constitution. Therefore, he added that the Human Rights Council has no legal or ethical right to make such observations. He added that the Human Rights High Commissioner has been briefed in this regard. And meanwhile, Cabinet Spokesman Minister Dallas Araha Parima says that Sri Lanka has jointly among nations which have inoculated more than half of the population. The minister made these remarks while speaking at a media briefing held to announce the Cabinet decisions today. Our World Data in website has reported that Sri Lanka is ranked at the first place among the nations which have shown high vaccination percentage within seven days and vaccination speed. According to the website, Sri Lanka was ranked at the first place in the previous week as well. The website has further indicated that the United States, France, India and China are placed below of Sri Lanka in terms of the speed of the vaccination drive. So far, a total of 24,226,161 vaccine doses have been administered to the public in the country under the COVID-19 immunization program. A total of 13,553,534 vaccines have received the first dose thus far, for while 10,672,627 have received the second dose. The inoculation programs for the persons between 20 to 29 years of age are currently underway in many centres in Western Province. The vaccination program held at the St. Lucas Church premises in Borella was organised by Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children in Colombo. An appointment for the vaccination can be reserved through the hospital website. Facilities have been provided for the persons under any age category to receive the vaccine at the centre. Mobile vaccination programs for senior citizens and persons with special needs are underway in many districts. A total of 1,945,785 vaccine doses have been inoculated to the public in the last seven days. A total of 147,114 doses were administered yesterday. Meanwhile, a total of 1,628 COVID-19 infected persons have been identified in the country today. So far, a total of 62,894 persons are currently receiving treatments, while 1,354 recoveries were reported today. Accordingly, a total of 415,649 recoveries have been reported in the country thus far. The Director General of Health Services confirmed 136 COVID-19-related deaths yesterday. A mobile COVID-19 emergency treatment unit was established in the Peradhini Teaching Hospital yesterday. It has been donated by Premium International Limited at a cost of 54 million rupees. Minister Kehele Rambukwalla, Director General of Health Services Dr. Aselaguna Vardhana and Chairman of Premium International Limited Prasan Nekularatna were present at this occasion. A special oxygen network has been established at the infectious disease hospital in Angoda. Accordingly, oxygen will be supplied through a mechanism to the patient bedsides in wards through oxygen bank. A PCR laboratory established at the Katonaik International Airport with the intention to uplift the tourism industry will be declared open on September 20th. Minister Prasanna Ranatunga engaged in an observation to at the premises today. The laboratory equipped to conduct 7,000 PCR tests in a day. Atwell organization, Colombo and Gampa divisions of St. John's Ambulance Service carried out disinfection programs in various religious and public places across the country. The program has been titled as Suar Raksha Atwala. Under this program, a total of eight temples and 200 housing units in the relevant area are recently. The programs were held under the supervision of private secretary to the president Sugishwara Bandara. Steps have been taken to open post and sub-post offices for a period of four days in a week during the quarantine curfew period. Accordingly, the offices will be closed on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Postmaster General Ranjit Ratna said that senior citizens' payments will be made through the offices on September 17th and 18th. The President of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, made remarks on the importance of receiving the vaccine against COVID-19.
vaccines is not anything new for this country. We have been able to eradicate many infectious diseases based on the use of vaccines. Our health network in the country is so well established and our vaccination percentage here in the country was more than 99% previously before the COVID era. So the vaccination is not anything new to Sri Lankans and we know that when we vaccinate, we vaccinate the normal health the people so that the vaccines have to be with actually no side effects or minimum side effects. There is a myth, unfounded myth with regard to vaccines among the younger population here in Sri Lanka and what uh, it means is that the uh, vaccination would lead them to development of sexual dysfunction or infertility. They both are unfounded and baseless myths and I would encourage all younger generation to obtain their vaccine whatever is available for them as early as possible because by getting your vaccine you do so much service to yourself as well as to your community and to your own family. It is clear that most of the deaths, the minimum number of deaths deaths that have happened among children had been with children who are with chronic and long-term diseases, the well-known diseases, heart problems, thalassemia, hemophilia, and so on. It has been decided that these children with disorders need vaccination and vaccine recommended is Pfizer. So when we vaccinate children, it has to be carried out very meticulously, methodically uh, by the doctors and with the consent of parents and the records have to be maintained. And as it had been carried out out for decades here in Sri Lanka, I think that it becomes essential that we incorporate the system of vaccination to the hospital setting over the years. There is a lockdown declared here in Sri Lanka, but a proper lockdown is not anything new for Sri Lankans as we were in a lockdown at, at the initial stages. But the present lockdown that we see, so many people in roads. So what as people in the community uh, could think of and contribute is that while the government is maintaining the essentials for people, we as the community have to be concerned and to reduce, minimize our mobility as much as possible so that we get out of our houses only for essential needs and it's only a minimum number that would get out of the house so that we at the end of the lockdown period, we would achieve the maximum as a country that we could achieve the benefits of this lockdown. A cordial meeting between Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha and Sri Lankans residing in Italy was held in Bologna today. Persons representatives of various religions in Italy took part in this event. The Sri Lanka delegation in Italy extended their appreciation to the Prime Minister for allocating a meeting with them amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha said that following the friendship built between the nations during the presidential tenure has provided many facilities for the Sri Lankans residing in Italy. The Sri Lankan representatives in Italy said that the Prime Minister's decision to establish a Council General office in Milan provided relief for many issues faced by them during that period. The representatives requested the Prime Minister to provide the necessary facilities to obtain the pension when they received the following 20 years of service in Italy after returning to the motherland. The Prime Minister requested Foreign Minister Professor G. L. Pires to carry out discussions regarding the proposal and Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha is set to take part in several diplomatic meetings in the next couple of days. The government has decided to provide a certified price rate of 55 rupees for a kilogram of Nadu paddy during the Lala season. The cabinet spokesman Minister Ramesh Patirana says that cabinet of ministers granted approval in this regard yesterday. Minister Ramesh Patirana said that the president has decided to allocate a certified price rate of 55 rupees for a kilo of Nadu paddy during the paddy purchasing process with the objective to conduct a more successful paddy purchasing program and to provide a positive economic climate for the farmer community during the Yala season this year. Accordingly, he said that the relevant proposal was approved by the cabinet of ministers. He said that during the previous government period, the price rate given for a farmer community was at 32 rupees. However, he added that the government has been able to increase the amount to 55 rupees within a short period of time. 
Co-Cabinet spokesman State Minister Ramesh Patra says that the government is considering different avenues of producing organic fertilizer while importing certain nutrients which were required for the agricultural sector in the country. Sri Lankan tea is the most expensive tea in the world. We are getting about a 4 to 4.5 dollars per kg, which is more, much more expensive than tea that is produced in India and Kenya. And also in relation to the tea production, uh, there is no significant drop as such. For month of July, we have produced 26 million kilos in this country, which is the average production. In fact, it's little higher than the averages that we have recorded in last years. So it's little more. And uh, first six months of the year, we have produced 162 million kilos which is above the average. So fortunately, we had very good climatic conditions and we also had a decent amount of fertilizer to be distributed. But we are very closely monitoring the situation in month of September. Generally, uh, historically, we have seen the reduction of tea production in months of September and October due to the drought and the conditions prevailing in the country historically. But we are uh, closely monitoring and we are looking at different avenues of uh, producing organic fertilizer and also to import certain nutrients which are required for the agricultural sector generally. Co-Cabinet spokesman, State Minister Ramesh Patirana further added that the Rubber Research Institute of Sri Lanka is experimenting on the fungus that has begun to spread among rubber plantations across the country. This particular disease is reported in different parts of the world, including Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam and other countries where there are rubber plantations. Rubber Research Institute is also experimenting in relation to the disease and utilizing different uh, mechanisms including certain fungicides but there is a practical difficulty because this disease is most of the time the fungus are on the downside of the leaves and there are difficulties in relation to spraying mechanisms it's a little difficult to curtail as you know now yes it is obviously affecting the productivity of the of the tree but also the rubber research institute at this particular moment they are lacing with the other institutions worldwide to find out a definitive treatment for that but as at now there is no definitive treatment found in the world, but hopefully we should be able to find something sooner than later. And meanwhile, co-cabinet spokesman State Minister Ramesh Pantirada made remarks on the prevailing economic situation in the country. Constantly discuss about the prevailing economic situation of the country and world over for that matter, which has been badly affected by the pandemic. But there is no significant change from the policy, but we are trying to strengthen our economy. That had been the case since the beginning of this year. And to do that, we have uh, curtailed the imports and also we are trying to improve the exports. Fortunately, our exports have gone up a little in all sectors, including apparel, plantation and also other engineering related stuff has gone up. And also, we are uh, narrowing down the gap between you know, the exports and imports, which is something very important for the foreign reserves and also for the currency. So hopefully we are looking forward to receive some investments also. And also uh, foreign remittance would be increasing in time to come. And the world as a general phenomenon coming out of this uh, pandemic scenario. So hopefully we will get tourists also to come to this country by November, December. And we will uh, generate much needed uh, dollars in the local economy. So uh, that is the way forward. And also specific plans would be detailed in the 2022 budget speech by Honorable uh, Minister of Finance, Basil Rajabaksha. The government has decided to publish the policy targets for renewable energy development. Accordingly, the Cabinet of Ministers has granted approval for the issuance of the applicable guidelines in this regard. In par with the national policy framework, Vistas of Prosperity and Splendor, it has been aimed to obtain 70% of the total electricity requirement from renewable energy sources by 2030. Measures have been taken to develop a zero-carbon energy generation by 2050. Accordingly, Ceylon Electricity Board has to prepare the minimum cost long-term generation plan in this regard. The Minister of Electricity has to issue general policy guidelines to the Ceylon Electricity Board for the preparation of the power generation plan. Accordingly, the Cabinet of Ministers has granted approval for the proposal presented by the subject minister in this regard. The Section 88.2 of Civil Procedure Court has been amended. The relevant bill received the approval of Cabinet Ministers to be presented to the Parliament. The relevant proposal was presented by Minister of Justice. The Attorney General has confirmed that the relevant draft bill is in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. It has been observed that the provisions enable the defendant to employ delay in tactics and to resist a just claim of the plaintiff. Accordingly, the section has been amended to avoid such negative impacts. 
The Cabinet of Ministers has granted approval to select the consultancy service for the construction of the expressway on pillars from Atharugiriya interchange of the Outer Circular Expressway to the Kalania Bridge via Rajagiriya. The approval was granted by the Cabinet of Ministers on May 24 this year to award the contract for the construction of Expressway to the China Harbour Engineering Corporation on the basis of designing, building, funding, operating and transferring. The construction of relevant expressway is expected to be completed within three years. Steps have been taken to prepare a mechanism for the utilization of identified mineral which are yet to be utilized. Accordingly, a committee comprised of experts of the field is set to be appointed in this regard. The future proceedings of this regard will be determined based on the recommendations of the committee. The minerals with an economic value among the existing within the country have been categorized under four groups. Accordingly, the committee will be provided with responsibilities to carry out detailed research on the areas where the minerals are located, the extent of the minerals, the quantities and the related products in order to plan the program to utilize such mineral in economic purposes. The government expects to establish formal diplomatic relations with East Timor. The Cabinet of Ministers granted approval to the proposal presented by the Foreign Minister in this regard. And the fact research group has alleged that flawed economic management during the 2015 to 2019 period has impacted on the present foreign reserve shortage. Only a sum of 12,050 million US dollars was added into the country's economy through international sovereign bonds during this period. The fact research group has pointed out that through its report that the foreign reserves amounts during the 2015 to 2019 period remained far less than the amount in 2014. The foreign reserves in the country by December 2014 were at 8208 million US dollars. However, the reserves continued to deplete to 7281 million US dollars by November 2015 and to 5644 million US dollars by November 2016. By November 2019, the foreign reserves in the country was remained at 7520 million US dollars. The report issued by the Fact Research Group has indicated that the reserves had declined compared to the year 2014. The group has further pointed out that even though 12,050 million US dollars worth international sovereign bonds were issued during 2015 to 2019 period, the economy continued to show a sluggish behavior. Compared to 2014, the gross national production during the five years of the Yahapalne government has only increased by 4 billion rupees. The per capita income during the five year period has increased by 31 US dollars from 3,821 to 3,852 US dollars only. The Yahapalne the government has extended its consent for the payment of foreign loans at an interest of 7.85% at certain occasions. The fact research group has indicated that such moves would incur devastating impacts on an economy similar to Sri Lanka. The revenue, which was at 4.3 billion US dollars in 2018, had dropped to 3.6 billion US dollars due to the Easter Sunday attack. It is also significant that soaring bonds have not been issued for the years 2020 and 2021. However, the report issued by the FACF Research Group has indicated that the lockdown measures decline on production and collapse of the tourism industry due to the COVID-19 outbreak in the country have impacted the economy in Sri Lanka negatively. The seven-day period chanting ceremony held at the Mirsavatiya sacred site in Anuradhapura was concluded yesterday. The aim of this effort was to invoke blessings to the government, including the president, prime minister, as well as the global community, while eradicating the COVID-19 pandemic. The Pirith chanting ceremony was commenced on the 7th of this month. The Pirith chanting ceremony was headed by Chancellor of Rajarata University and Chief Incumbent of Mirisavetia Temple, Venerable Dr. Ethala Vatunuvave Nyanadilekathera, under the guidance of Atamastana Dipati, Venerable Dr. Pallegama Sirinivasathera, and Chief Incumbent of Ruan Velisaya, Venerable Pallegama Hemaradnathera. Minister Damal Rajapaksha and Sri Lanka Army Commander General Shavendra Silva placed garlands on the statue of King Dutugamanu yesterday, bestowing the Dehatwatya to Mahasaya. Sangha Minister Namal Rajapaksha invited them for the Pirith chanting ceremony. Hundreds of bhikkhus, including Venerable Dr. Berlan Viladhar Maratanathera, Venerable Dr. Kollupitiye Mahinda Sankarakitathera, Venerable Muruthetuve Anandathera, Venerable Kirinde Asajithera, and Venerable Professor Madhaguda Abhayathisathera concluded the Pirith chanting ceremony. 
The Pirith chanting ceremony was held without the participation of the devotees due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister SM Chandra Srena, State Minister Shrehan Sema Singha, Lohan Ratwatta and Professor Channa Jasumana were present at this occasion. Parliamentarians D.P. Kumar Siri, former Chief Minister of North Central Province SM Ranjit, Secretary to the Minister of Buddhist Asana, Religious and Cultural Affairs Professor Kapila Gunavardhana, Commissioner General of Buddhist Affairs Sunanda Karya Peruma and Chief Trustee Janesh Gra Dharma Vardhana were present at this ceremony. The lighting systems set up at the new Kalani Bridge were tested last evening. The completed new Kalani Bridge will be bestowed with the public in November. The lighting system has been set up under the instructions directed by Minister Johnston Fernando to the project engineers in July. The new Kalani Bridge was designed with the purpose to connect near completed and proposed expressway network within the Colombo region. The new Kalani Bridge and connected road systems is expected to reduce the severe traffic congestion which exists from Colombo County Main Road and Katnaka Expressway to Colombo City. 20% of the weight of the bridge will be borne by the high tech stay cable system connected upon the pillars erected on the either sides of the Kalani River. The lighting system has been set up on four pillars and stay cable system. And meanwhile, the Ministry of Mass Media has directed attention to set up a special centre for the persons with various disabilities for media use and to fulfil related needs. Minister Dalla Salaha Peruma, while speaking at a media briefing held to announce the cabinet decisions today, that the centre will be declared open on September 23rd, which is also the Sign Language Day. Minister Dalla Salahap Peruma said that only the national television and the Sirasa channel represent their news bulletins with the sign language. Therefore, he requested other institutions to present news bulletins with sign language considering the speech and hearing impaired persons. He added that the ITN channel has made preparations to include sign language into their news bulletins from September 23rd. He also said that a centre will be established at the department premises for persons with various disabilities for media usage and related needs. The minister also said that the media should be sensitive when reporting on children and persons with disabilities. Minister Dalla Salaha Peruma said that a heavy criticism had circulated on media platforms over an incident related to an alleged inoculation of a child with disabilities by a doctor in Anamadua. He said that this incident was reported in electronic media. He also said that Professor Nilika Malavigi has claimed in her website that as well as Facebook that the statement had been distorted. Also, they made remarks over a news report which indicated that 25 teachers had died during demonstrations. Therefore, he requested media institutions to be more sensitive of issues pertaining to children and community with various disabilities when reporting. Mahakanadara Canal, which supplies water to Mahakanadara Reservoir from Iru Rang Thirupani, is currently under the modernization process. Accordingly, financial provision worth 380 million rupees have been allocated for this project. The modernization project commenced yesterday amidst blessings of Mahasanga. Minister Nama Rajapaksa, after participating in the inauguration ceremony, took part in a discussion on the proposed Northern Water Supply Project. Heads of the Agrarian Association in Mahakanadara Agrarian Zone took part in the discussion, which was held at the Anuradhapura District Secretariat Auditorium. Minister S.M. Chandrasena, State Ministers Shehan Seva Singha and Anuradha Jayaratna also participated in the meeting. City Development Initiative in Hambadra District under the Dayak Nagana Siak Nagara Development Program was inaugurated today with the participation of Minister Nama Rajapaksa. It was held in Rana Town. The City Development Initiatives were also commenced in Ambalantara, Nonagama and Chitragala, Viravila, Lunagam Vehera today. State Minister D. V. Chanaka, Chairman of Hambantra District Development Committee, MP Upul Galapati and Hambantra District MP Ajit Rajapaksa were present at the occasion. Welcome back with your sports update and the national television has obtained the official broadcasting rights of the T20 Cricket World Cup set to begin next month. The World Cup campaign will be held from October 17th until the November 14th. The tournament will be taking place in both the United Arab Emirates and Oman. The championship consists of 45 matches and all matches will be telecasted through Channel I. And with that, we conclude tonight's news. Do just tomorrow at the very same time. Stay safe. Good night. Good night.